Are you looking for truth from God's Word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. And I pray that this series will be one that will greatly help you, not only if you have a troubled heart, but I know that there are those of you that have come to a point in your life that you know some of these truths to really help you. And so this is just a reminder and an encouragement. But I want to equip you because we live in a world that it's getting worse and worse and worse and almost anything could happen at any time that would disrupt our lives so hugely that we would need to be able to come alongside those who have a troubled heart and we want to point them to Christ. And we don't just want to say, trust in Christ and then walk away. We don't want to give them a lot of tea and sympathy. We want to be able to give them God's word. And so my desire is to be able to share with you from God's word what he has to say about how he is the one who can comfort the troubled heart. Now, because there were so many that were out last week, I'd like to just take a few extra minutes today because of our love for you that you would not be feeling left out. And I'd like to give you a little bit of the background of where we are because we are in a series called Comfort for the Troubled Heart. So if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to open them up now to the Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and you're going to turn to John chapter 14. I also encourage you to take that little outline that's found in your worship folder out and make all the notes that you would like so you can have a copy of this so that you can then share it with others and make some sense. Now, while we'll spend the bulk of our time in John chapter 14, in a few moments, I'm going to take you to other passages because I want to teach you what God has to say about the whole concept of counseling other people. Because while the word here will help counsel us on comforting our hearts, There's also a technique and things that we need to keep in mind if we want to help other people. So I know that if I asked you to raise your hand now, how many of you have experienced a troubled heart? Or maybe how many of you right now have a troubled heart? Most of you could raise your hand. And that's not too unusual. If you look at Scripture here, even in the context of John chapter 14, these disciples were just overwhelmed by a troubled heart. And that's why in verse 1, Jesus says this to them in John chapter 14. He says, let not your heart be troubled. Now, I know as well as many of you that might listen to conservative talk radio that there's one particular personality that likes to be throwing out that phrase a lot. The challenge that I have with that is that he really doesn't offer a biblical solution to the troubled heart. He tries to help you see things from a different perspective or just wait, things will get better or whatever. So in other words, he's trying to get our eyes on circumstances rather than on a sovereign God. And so I know he means well, but I believe that that is a very short-lived, unsustainable objective or antidote to a troubled heart. So I'd like to, again, go back to Scripture. Now, if you know, we're in the section now, what people often refer to as the Passion Week. This is just a few days before he goes to trial. In fact, in this passage, I think it's just almost the night before, as he's winding down at the Last Supper and teaching these things before he heads out into the garden to pray. And so he knows that his disciples, seeing the kind of clouds on the horizon, something is happening by his conversation. And if you don't know what all that is, just read chapter 13. You know that their hearts are becoming troubled. Now, you might look at those different events, and it's important for us to know those. But if you look what those events caused in their life and what was happening, I think you could identify better. First of all, we know that these disciples had a troubled heart because of the fear of failure. If you recall, looking at their lives, there were many times that the disciples failed. They failed quizzes, or they failed tests, or they failed in situations. They failed in responses. Even Peter, in chapter 13, was said, after he said, I'll follow you to the very end. And then the Lord says, no, you won't. You're going to deny me three times. So there was that fear of the future, that fear of failure. Now, some of you might be facing some things in your life right now based on some past things where you fail, but you know you've got to step out a little bit, and you have that fear of failure. Maybe it's a new relationship or a marriage or being a parent or maybe on a new job or going to a new school. Whatever it might be, you might be afraid of failing, and your heart is a little troubled as you see this coming at you, and you're not sure how you're able to to withstand it or to come against it or rise above it. The other, they had a bit of confusion. Jesus said on more than one occasion... He's saying, I want you to follow me, but where I'm going, you can't go, but I'll come to you, but you can't come with me now. And so there was some confusion. Do you want me to follow you or do you not want me to follow you? What are we supposed to do? And I imagine that some of you are in a a message or in in a place in your life where you're wondering, what does the Lord really want me to do? I could tell you as your pastor that there have been times that I've been faced with tremendous dilemmas of decisions that Carol and I have had to make whether it was spending money or dealing with a doctor to deal with some health issues, or whether it's even a call to what part of the country in which we should go minister. 
And how many times I wish I could just say to the Lord, Lord, I know you speak to us. I know it's in your word right here. But just today, just for me once, I won't tell anybody you did this, but would you come down and just sit in that chair right there and tell me exactly what you want me to do? How many of you felt like that? Say, uh-huh. uh-huh. All right, we've all been there. So they were experiencing this confusion. And when you're confused, especially if your personality style is one that you like stability, you can imagine that your heart is very, very troubled. Besides all that, there was this disappointment. If you recall, just shortly before this event, all the people, or many of the Jews, thousands came, and what they were doing is doing what we would call Palm Sunday. They were trying to make Jesus king for that moment as he came in on that donkey. And again, get that CD. I taught you all about that. And so here they are thinking, okay, now everything is going to happen really, really good. And now Jesus is saying, where I'm going, you can't come. Now they can hear that there was one that's going to betray him. They just finished hearing about that. And now they're thinking, Jesus is probably going to die. There's something really bad that's going to happen. So perhaps they had a dream that they had that was now shattered. And with that dream, that dream kind of just went down in front of them. We thought this was going to happen, but now we see that it's probably not going to happen here. How many of you had a dream? And that dream was shattered. Whether it was the dream of starting a new business and then it went bankrupt. Or maybe the dream of having a wonderful marriage and and you were saying to one another, till death do we part, and all of a sudden you're parting, and it wasn't because of death, and so your dream is shattered. And so you can imagine what they're feeling and the troubled heart that they might have. Again, Jesus is still speaking to these men, his future leaders of the church, and he's saying to them, don't let your heart be troubled. But he tells them how their heart does not need to be troubled, and that's where we're on this journey, learning from this passage of Scripture. And of course they had the fear. If Jesus is not going to be here, and we're hearing how the Jews are coming against Jesus, and they've watched that happen, and now they want to kill Christ, you know, we were kind of guilty by association. Maybe they'll want to come after us. So here we are following this guy. What's happened to our business? What happens to our future? Maybe we could die too. And that's why they fled at the end, except for one that just hung nearby. So maybe you have that same fear of something that is really bad that's going to happen to you. You're right at the brink. You don't know if your business will survive. You don't know if the relationship will survive. You don't know if your career will survive. You don't know if your health will survive. You don't know if your investments will survive. And so there is a tremendous fear factor that is facing you today, and your heart is troubled. Now, you need to know, having a troubled heart is not necessarily a sin. The same word that says, let not your heart be troubled, earlier Jesus had the same word there to talk about his troubled heart. Now, that's because that troubled heart does not necessarily mean sin. It does mean sin if we let our heart be troubled and we don't deal with it appropriately or we'll say biblically. And then that's where our problem comes. Remember the illustration I used last week that came from old Billy Sunday? He said, you don't want to let a bird, it's okay if a bird lands in your head, but you don't want him to build a nest there. So when things come at you and you have that momentary troubled heart, then what you do, you grab a hold of that troubled heart and biblically you deal with it. And God says through that, he then, his method will calm that troubled heart. So what I want to do is maybe remind a lot of you what you need to do in calming your troubled heart. And at the same time, to equip you in showing to others what the spiritual medicine is when they go through a situation that brings on a troubled heart. It might help you to know that the word trouble actually means like a stormy sea. And those of you that can't connect to a stormy sea as much, you might think about it as a jacuzzi, and you turn that jacuzzi on, and it's just boiling away. When you have a troubled heart, I can define that for you. A troubled heart is when you have a difficult time sleeping and you can't really go to sleep and you wake up and you think about it again and you have worry that's coming at you. That would be a troubled heart. How do you handle that? Well, some people deny it. I don't have a troubled heart. Other people go to all sorts of escapisms. Now, the worst would be alcohol and drugs and all of that stuff. But some of us go to things that might seem to be acceptable. We plunge into work, we plunge into television, we plunge into the computer, we plunge into video games or whatever it might be. Whatever it will do to momentarily take our mind off our troubled heart. And that moment we feel better because we're not thinking about that, but it didn't biblically resolve in a sustainable way our troubled heart. So there's a lot of things that we might try to do to eliminate that troubled heart. So here's my question. What is your strategy that you've used? And the strategy that you used, how long did it really work for you? And then ask yourself about the troubled hearts. Did you have a troubled heart because the Lord, without you being in control of your life, allowed something to come into your life, permitted it, prescribed it, it's his will, he's in control, and now that caused your troubled heart. We have a couple here today that gave me permission to share this. 
Husband's on the mainland this past week. She's doing the things that ladies would do and wives would do, and then she looks at her phone, and there's a text message from husband, and then another one from the son that says, you better call dad, contact dad. Well, when you get something like that, you're starting to wonder, why didn't I, how did this, what is this all about, and you're not hearing a voice on the end. She calls and finds out that her husband was in a grinding automobile accident on the freeway in the L.A. area, in, in California. He's, on a, he's in a rental vehicle on the freeway. The freeway slows to a stop like we have here often. A big box delivery truck traveling at 50 miles an hour slams in the back of him, spins the car around. Glass and the, and the whole vehicle basically exploded on the freeway. The interesting thing is that God was so good that normally when he goes to the mainland, he rents the cheapest little small car that you could get. They didn't have one, so all that was left was a big truck, a big four-door pickup truck. Had he been in a small car, her troubled heart would have been at the hospital or at the morgue dealing with this. Now you see, all it takes is one text, one phone call to have a troubled heart. Now, did he do anything wrong? Absolutely not. The Lord permitted it to build character in his life. Then there are those of us that may have made some choices that we made that were just unwise. We didn't think it through. We didn't pray about it. We didn't seek counsel. We didn't go to spiritual leaders in our life to get their opinion on it. We just did it. That's an unwise thing, and we're suffering the consequences of wrong choices. And then there are those that we know the Spirit of God, we knew the Word of God, and maybe we even rejected counsel that told us what we were about to do is wrong, whether it be from our mate or a loved one, and we just plowed ahead and did it anyway. And now that has exploded into our life, and we are living the results of that pain today. And you have a troubled heart. So however it happened, whether it was your fault or someone else's, whether it was something that dealt with finances or fitness or friends or foes or family, it doesn't matter. If we have a troubled heart, God does have an answer for that. So again it says here, Jesus says, do not let your heart be troubled, which means that we have control of our own heart because the Lord says, don't let your heart be troubled. Now some of us have personalities that might be more, have propensity to a troubled heart. And so it's easier for us to have our heart troubled. Now, you know people like that that just seem to be far more sensitive and little of things trouble their hearts. You might have children like that as well. But in this passage, it says, don't let your heart be troubled, which means you're controlling your own heart, so don't let it be troubled. And it's like a command, don't let it be troubled. And so there are some things that we can do. Without even giving you point number one, I think the bottom line is we need to listen to Jesus Christ because since he's the one that knows all, sees all, and everything is naked and open before him, Hebrews 4.13, then he's aware of what's happening in our life. And so therefore, I need to go to the one who permitted or prescribed or will at least help me get out of this troubled heart. And I need to listen to him. Now with that, I'm going to need to leave the Gospel of John for a few moments here because I want to give you a, a chain reference of some scriptures on why we need to use the Word of God especially and foremost as a basis for whatever counseling we might do. So to first off, I'd like you to turn to Isaiah chapter 9. Now these will not be on your notes. They will not be on the screen. This is fresh stuff that I decided to give to you as I was going to go ahead and go through this on a comfort for a troubled heart. I wanted to give you some background today, so I'm going to give you some stuff ahead of time. So turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 9, if you will. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. I want to set the case that when you're going to do counseling and when you're going to help, you're going to seek out help for your troubled heart, obviously you know you need to go to Jesus. Now, if I was to ask you, why would you go to Jesus? Now, you could give me a lot of answers. They probably are pretty good. So I would like to give you the ones that I think have the most substance to it in the question, why would I want to go to Jesus when I have a troubled heart? So let's look at Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. This is a passage we often use at Christmas time because it reflects on the future coming of the Messiah or Jesus Christ. Verse 6 says, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. So let's just look at four of those. You have Counselor, God, Father, and Peace. Before those four identifications of Jesus Christ, the coming Messiah, you'll see some words. The first one is Wonderful Counselor. Now, there are some writers that think that there is really eight identifications of the coming of Christ here. And it very well could be because one describes the other. But I think they're better understood in a couplet. So the first you want to look at is that he would be known as the Wonderful Counselor. 
So if you want to know right off, who would be the one to provide us counsel when we go through issues in life to give us advice? Well, we know that it would be Christ. But he's not just the counselor. He's known as the wonderful counselor. Okay, he's the wonderful counselor. Well, what's that such a big deal about? Well, that wonderful counselor, he's only going to counsel if he disseminates information to help us. So if you want, you could write the next verse in your margin and then follow with me to Isaiah chapter 28, if you will. At chapter 28, and then we're going to look at Isaiah 28, verse 29. So we know that he's identified as the wonderful counselor. Now in verse 29, it says this of Isaiah 28. He said, Isaiah says, This also comes from the Lord of hosts, referring to Jehovah God, who has made his counsel wonderful. Now, you might want to mark that in your Bible because not only is he known as the wonderful counselor, his counsel, that which he shares, is also full of wonder, that it's also wonderful and his wisdom is great, which now tells me that, all right, he is the counselor and he has a battery of truth that I need to know and that truth is not only going to be helpful, but it's also wise and wonderful. So that takes the superlatives off of all that I might hear from other people and it puts it on the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has to say for me. Now would be a good time for me to give you a little sidebar if I could speak that language for a moment. You might be saying, well, you know, what about those counselors that provide medicine? And what about those that need special treatments or special uh, therapy sessions, etc.? Well, first of all, it is my opinion that probably a lot of that might have been headed off at the pass if they had good counsel to start with. I think some of the medicine that's given is probably not necessary if they had more biblical type counseling. Yet there is a time that when there's a chemical imbalance, a physiological problem with our system that we're not able to, hear it is, think clearly that we might need some help to get us to a point so that we can begin to think clearly. And when we can, the best therapy is going to be found in the Word of God, the counsel of God's Word with the wonderful counselor, the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is to clear, the, the medicine and special therapy is to clear the fog away for the purpose of only getting back into the Word. What some of you might know, and many of you don't know, is that when we ministered in San Antonio, Carol and I came believing God led us to that city. We came in a, in a VW van, and we arrived there not even knowing where we were going to stay. Within one day, we found a place. Within one week, I was able to get on the radio, so we had a radio program. It was called Make It Clear. That program brought so many listeners to us, but they were all scrambled up with problems, so... I said, why don't you stop by the house? So we converted one of our bedrooms into an office. And so while the family was there in another room, I would be counseling people. My premise of my belief in counseling is that I would not do Christian counseling. Because my belief is that you can be a Christian who counsels but doesn't use God's word. My belief was that we would do biblical counseling and rise and fall on what God had to say. And any of those that were beyond my ability or had physiological problems, I would put them with other Christians who would then do what I just said a few moments ago. From that then, there were so many people coming and getting better, but there was no sound Bible teaching church that would take people through scripture verse by verse, so we planted a church there. Then there were people like many of you that are saying, I want to be equipped to do ministry. There was no Bible college at all in San Antonio, so we started a Bible institute, then became a Bible college, then became an extension school for Dallas Seminary. So God did it all on this one premise, is that we believe that the Bible here has the answers to our problems, and that he is the wonderful counselor, and his counsel is wise, and it is great. It's wonderful counsel. Now, we can leave Isaiah for just a moment, and if you will, go to Psalms. And if you will, turn to Psalms 119. Keeping with the same thrust from Scripture that if God made us, and he knows all about us, and he knows the ramifications of sin and choices in our life, or sinful people in our life that come against us, and he's aware of all of that, and he's telling us, that he is the wonderful counselor, and then he permits to have written in scripture, prescribed by his inspiration, that his counsel is wise, that I ought to be listening to what the word and Jesus has to say to me. So now we go to Psalm 119. Psalm 119 was penned by David, and uh, David, underneath the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said this in Psalm 119. Follow along, if you will, in verse 24. He says here, as a prayer to the Lord, almost a praise, your testimonies also are my delight. Let's stop for a moment. I love reading that phrase when it says, your word, your counsel, your testimonies are my delight. When I think about the word delight, I ask myself, what do you delight in? What really is it? Mm -mm, mm -mm, what do you really like? Well, oddly enough, I really enjoy pizza. 
And so last night, Carol and I broke all of our rules, and we decided we're going to go to Costco and pick up a pizza. And we broke our rules because we're trying to you know, eat right and all this stuff, but boy, that pizza was so good. We got that pizza, and I, um, well, I had just a little less than five slices. Anyway, that point being is I delighted in that. If that doesn't work for you, I want you to think of a child who you buy him ice cream or maybe a, a shave ice here on the island, and they're just going to town, and it's now kind of leaking over the side. It's dripping down their elbow, and they're kind of licking it, and they're trying to eat that thing as much as they can. They don't care about what's happening in Egypt. They don't care what Dad did on his job. Their whole world is gone except for this one shave ice, this one ice cream cone that they have. And by goodness, if any of the brother or sister goes after it from them, no, mine, 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 they're delighting in this. Now, however picture works for you, that should be the picture that we delight in his word, that everything else gets pushed aside, everything else comes second for his word. Now, that doesn't mean we don't go to work. He didn't say that's the only thing. But we put that, that trumps all. That's the default. Is always God's word. Now, that's not enough for us when I just read this one passage here of verse 24, that they're my delight. Then it says, and they are my counselors. They are my counselors. Now, if you are following me through this basis, what I'm trying to give to you here, I want you to listen very carefully. In Isaiah, it said about the Lord, Jesus, it said, you are the wonderful counselor. The rest of the time, when it refers to the word, it refers to counselors. That means that Christ needed no other counselor. He needed no other counsel. He needed to have no more discussions with him. He is the great I am. He is the supreme one. He is all wisdom. He is all wise. He's the great one. Omniscient. And so from him disseminates all the truth that he wants us to have in his word. And so now my counsel that can come from counselors is best to come when those counselors are bringing to me the counsels of his word because that's who he is. And that's how he's communicated to us. Well, that might not be enough for us as well. So let's look at a couple other verses on how important the counsel is to us and how important his word is to us. And I really, really enjoy going through this. Look, if you will, for a moment now to Psalm 119 and look at verse 16. 119, verse 16. The same idea of delighting is here. But there's also a phrase I want us to, to look at that's important. Verse 16 says, I shall delight in your statutes. Now, some of you would want to maybe spend a whole day today going over what's the difference between a testimony, a commandment, and a statute, and a precepts, and the word, and a testimony. Well, folks, let me just try to be as simple as I can. Each one of those terms do have a special nuance. Otherwise, it would not have been given in so many different varieties, like Technicolor. On the other hand... Instead of us trying to split today, what's a testimony, what's the word, what's a commandment, what's this, look at them like a baseball diamond. You have first base, second base, third base, and home plate. First is different than a second base. Second is different than third, but they're all part of the baseball diamond. So in, they're all different, but they're all part of the idea of God's mind on paper, truth for us today to know. So here it says, he delights in his statutes. But the last part of verse 16 is what I want you to see. It says, I shall not forget your word. So there's a great responsibility that we have to not only recognize that Jesus is the counselor, his word is the counsel, and that knowing his word and wanting to know his word with a spirit of delighting in it is important, but it's driven by that I ought not to forget his word. Now listen very carefully to this. I can't forget something unless I knew it to start with. Did you catch that phrase? I can't forget it unless I knew it. And that's why we have the preaching and the teaching and the small group studies and the discipleship programs and getting you into the Word by yourself because we want to just flood your thinking, flood your mind, flood your value system with God's Word. Now, once that's there, you now have given to the Holy Spirit the Word, the weapon, so that you can then attack the troubled heart but it also requires us not to forget his word. And so my prayer is that you won't forget what you're hearing today, especially the part of the scriptures that we have here, not to forget his word. Now again, why would his word be so important? Well, there's tons of reasons for that. But in the context of what I'm trying to tell you, I'd like you now to leave Psalm 119, if you will, and go to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. So for those of you that are looking for comfort, I want you to see that your primary source ought to be the Lord himself as he is revealed through his word from Genesis to Revelation and like I joke from 
index to maps. You want to get the entire scripture, God's mind on paper. That's your counsel. You want to do that. Now, those of you who are going to provide counsel for other people, and you're going to study counseling. You're listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando, Florida. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It is the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. Or you can mail your gift to Make It Clear, P.O. Box 607-901, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Thank you for helping us Make It Clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please send us an email at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.